Hello again, Carl and Archibald here. I'm going to make a, a new class. Um, the other one was just getting messy. Let's call this one Review More Stuff. The name of a class starts with a capital letter. It can't have any spaces in it. It's an identifier. We call this title case. Title case as opposed to camel case. And I'm going to add a main method. So we, you might notice, first of all, that we have two um, classes with main methods in them. That's OK. Uh, you can run a class so long as it has a main method in it. So if I want to run this class, I can right click on it and say run as a Java application and we can run that one. The one that we had before, I could also right click on it and say run as a Java application. So if there is an entry point, which means a main method in the class, you can run the class as an, appl as an application. And in this one, we're going to review the control structures. So the selection structures in Java are the if statement with or without an else clause and the switch statement. And what is the other one? Well, there is one other one. It's, it's really an operator. And maybe we should have done it in the previous video when we talked about operators, but this question mark colon operator is called a conditional operator. Some people call it the ternary operator because it has three operands. And then for repetition, things that we're going to talk about are the, the while loop, the do while loop, the for loop and something that's called the enhanced for. So my, my dogs are here participating in, in this review. <laughs> okay, well, let's look at the general form of an if statement. If is a keyword in Java. When you're in um, Eclipse and you get these um, faint boxes around something, you can tab through them. So if I hit tab, it will go out to the next one. So here's the general form of an if statement. If something is true, do something. What's in here must be a Boolean. So this doesn't compile yet. Expression expected after this token. So the expression can be anything that evaluates to a Boolean, including if true, that's not a very useful one because it will true will always be true, but something that evaluates to a boolean 10 is greater than 3, that's also not very useful because that's always going to be true, but you, you're getting the point here. Um, the mistake that people make when they're writing expressions that evaluate to a boolean, the first mistake you'll make is you'll use an assignment operator instead of the equals operator, which is if you if you pronounce the assignment operator as gets instead of equals, it's not an equality relationship, it's an action. And this one is an equality relationship. So gets versus equals, and you'll make that mistake somewhat less often. And here's the else part. Now, some people will say, we, we don't need these braces unless there's more than one statement in here. And that's true. So if we write A gets 10 and B gets a divided by B. I don't care what's in there. There's only one executable statement in the true part and in the false part. And people will say that we do not need the braces. 
In Java, the convention is you put the braces in all the time. So suppose we didn't put the braces there. It's still the same result, but someone will come along and they will add a line of code here. Now there's a problem. <clears throat> so two people working on the same piece of code. Whose fault is it that this error was added? It looks like this line of code belongs to the else because of the indentation, but it doesn't because of the missing braces. So whose fault was it that that error got introduced into this code? Well, in Java, the convention is it is the person who neglected to put the braces. So the rule is an if statement controls one statement or one compound statement, and you make a compound statement by putting lines of code inside of the braces. So we're going to um, follow the conventions, and these are not style. This is not style, it's convention. You don't get to make up your own conventions. Sun has dictated the conventions for writing Java when they created the language, and this settles a lot of arguments. So if someone says, I don't want to put braces there because they don't actually do anything, the answer is you have to because that's the convention. So the argument is over and things are much more efficient. Okay, so when you have your indentation all messed up, You should never present code to anyone else, including you should never present code to yourself that has indentation like this. No one, no professional should have to look at this and try and figure out what you meant. So Eclipse will fix this for you. Right click in the, so in the code window, look under source and pick format and it will put the code into the correct format. So here's the rule. Don't present your code to anyone else unless it's formatted. How long did that take us to do the formatting source format? Oh, it took about two seconds. Spend the two seconds. Fix up your code as you go along because the first person that you will confuse with poor code is yourself. So fix up your code as you go along by asking Eclipse to format the code for you. Okay, as soon as we get into control structures, we're going to um, we're going to run the code, and it will not do what we expect it to. Let's clear that console window for a minute. There. The first time you look at a piece of code that you didn't write, what you should probably do is set a breakpoint. You can double click out here in the margin and then walk through the code in the debugger and see what it's doing. The cost of code. Beginners believe that the cost of code is writing the code that solves the problem. Surprise! 80% of the cost of code is figuring out what existing code does. Figuring out what someone else has done sometimes figuring out what you've done. 80%. So in all of software development, we put the emphasis on writing code that someone else can figure out. Someone else can understand what you've done. And there's a big emphasis on how do you understand what someone else has already done. Put a breakpoint and run to the breakpoint. In Eclipse, we click on the bug to run to a breakpoint, or alternately, you could right-click and say debug as a Java application. So I'm going to debug this class as a Java application, and I clicked on the wrong one. If these had meaningful names, I probably wouldn't have. Debug as a Java application, and you'll get this warning that you're going to switch perspectives. So the perspective in Eclipse is the layout of the windows. We're in the Java editing um, perspective, and I'm going to say, yes, you can switch to the debug perspective. And 
the little arrow points at the line of code that has not yet executed. Okay, this is something that I have for my Android class. Um, so I'm just going to throw that away and it'll look more like yours. So in the debug perspective, what we have going on, we're running the program and we have stopped right there. We have the variables window up here. So the variables that are currently in existence, a, b, and args, and a and b have 10 and 6 in them. And if we want to execute one line of code, execute one line of code, we're going to do step over. Step over, or try to remember that this is the F6 key. F6. And you can see that this must have been true. 10 is greater than 6. And we went to into the true part, and we're going to assign A to 10, which wasn't very useful because A already has 10 in it. And we didn't see anything change up here, but we would have in debug mode, you can hover over the variables and you can see what's in them in Eclipse. So this is a very nice tool for helping you understand what the code is doing. So you will send me code and you'll say, gee, I don't know what this is doing. And I, before I help you with it, I'll say, could you set a breakpoint and walk through the code to show me where the problem is? And your response will be, oh, never mind, I found it. Okay, so have the code tell you what it's doing by walking over each line of code and seeing it execute. For whatever reason, this arrow pointing at the line of code causes you to look very closely at it and you'll see things that you didn't see before. So if we keep stepping over, when you get tired of being in the debugger, you can either hit this, resume, which will run to the next breakpoint if there is one. Or you can hit this red square which says terminate and you can end the program. Let's just terminate this one. The, the breakpoint stays there. We stayed in the debug perspective. It's probably not what we want. Let's go back to the Java perspective up here on the, at the top. Switch back to the Java perspective and this is the most comfortable environment for editing the code. A switch statement. The general form of a switch statement. It looks like this. So you switch on something. You switch on something that evaluates to an int or can be promoted to an int. So a module is 2. What are all of the possible integer values that we could put there? a module is 2 will evaluate to 0 or 1. It might be interesting to know that you may not switch on a long, something that can be promoted to an int byte short int and also car you can switch on a car so let's keep going with the the format oh, I put a semicolon there I meant to put a colon so you list the cases that are possible the cases that you expect and Put a breakpoint there, throw that one away, run to the breakpoint, or debug as a Java application. We hit this breakpoint, switch on A modulus 2. A modulus 2 is going to have a 0 in it, 10 modulus 2 is 0. Let's step. We jump to case 0. Now what will happen? Well, we fall into the next case. 
So it's going to print out it's a zero and it's a one. There's a bug. See how easy we found that bug by doing it in the debugger. So the bug, the thing that we left out is the break statement, which goes here. And each case should have a break statement. Well, suppose this evaluates to something that is not one of the cases. I'll just put a literal constant in there, 3. It's always going to match case 3 if there was one, but there isn't. So what we might want to do is to have a default case. And the default case means everything else. Now watch this. What is the good of that break statement? It has no function, but you're advised to put it there anyway. That's the convention, and the convention is there because someone else may add another case after the default. It's unlikely, but if someone else adds another case, whose fault is it that there was a bug introduced? Well, it would have been yours for not following the convention and having a break on each case. Sometimes you want more than one case to be combined, and you can stack them up like this. So what would happen if it were a 5? It would jump to here. What would happen if it were a 1? It would jump to here as well. So this is like saying, if it's case 1 or case 5, then do this. So you can think of it as case 1 doesn't have a break statement. Probably the formatting would not like that. Let's format this. And yes, it wants them, the formatting wants them to be stacked up. So case 1, jump to here and keep executing. Case 5 would jump to here and do the same thing. So I'm going to throw that one away so that it will kind of make sense. Let's, let's um, run to the breakpoint again. Debug as a Java application. And I'm not sure what happened. What did we just do? Terminate. Debug as a Java application. There, we hit the switch. We hit the switch that time. Not sure what happened the last time. Um, the first thing to do when something goes wrong is try it again. So switch on the integer five we jumped to the default case because we didn't match any of the others. The default case is optional. If you want one, you have one, and if you don't want one, you don't have one. If there's no default case and we execute this switch statement, it will just recognize that it doesn't match anything and it will fall out the bottom doing nothing. Okay, if you're in Java 7, if you're in Java 7, you can switch on a string. And a string is something in double quotes. So this is new. And if this doesn't compile for you, it's because whoops. If this doesn't compile for you, it's because you're not using Java 7. So they introduced this in um, Java 7 as if it were a huge, big thing. 
and it really isn't. It's something that exists in C Sharp, so the Java people have decided that it it would be a good thing to have in in Java. And now we can look at that string constant and jump to the case that's matching it. How do you know if you're in Java 7? Well, one way is to type something that won't compile if you're not in Java 7, and one way is to look at the properties of your application. So right-click on the name of the project, open up the Java compiler. So we're using the compliance from execution environment Java 1.7. If we weren't, suppose we were using 1.6. We can say, okay, let's apply that. A rebuild, build the project, yes. And lo and behold, this does not compile anymore because, oh, it even tells us you're using a compiler that's below 1.7. <clears throat> when you're working on a team, you need to all be using the same, the same compiler in your project. Let's switch back to 1.7. If we apply it, we'll have to rebuild the project. And now we have a switch statement that uses the strings and it does compile. So we looked at the if else, we looked at the switch statement. This um, operator is something that is, is a little bit handy. It's like an if else statement. So let's write C gets A is greater than B question mark 23 else a divided by b and the style is one space before and after every operator that's the convention not a style i said that wrong one space before and after every operator okay so what's going on here three operator three operands in this operator if this is true, the expression evaluates to, the whole expression evaluates to this. If this is false, the whole expression evaluates to this, the third operand. Let's talk about the data types here. Before the question mark must evaluate to a Boolean, it must be true or false. The second and third operands must be compatible with each other. In our case, they're both ints. So this expression evaluates to an int. Suppose I put 23.0 here. There's a problem. That means that this expression evaluates to a double, and you cannot assign a double to an int. Let's put that back. So let's let's play with that just a little bit. How about um, a is greater than b, and we know it is. So we're going to print out five. Else, we're going to print out. 34.78. What will this print? We'll evaluate that. A is greater than B. It will evaluate to true. And then we'll print out the 5, right? And that's wrong. We print out 5.0. These operands must be compatible with each other. So this whole expression evaluates to a double, not because of the 5, but because of the double here. 
So we don't print out 5, that's an int value, we print out 5.0. So it's like a little if-else statement and it does come in handy. Um, it's not essential. You could have written an if-else statement, but it is um, a little more convenient and people expect you to use this when you have the opportunity to do it. Those are all of the conditionals or the selection statements in the primitive parts of Java. Well, in all of Java, that's it. That's how you control the flow with selection. So selectively executing code. The repetition. Something that must evaluate to a Boolean goes in here. Oh, and put that one there for me. Something that must evaluate to a Boolean. A while loop is used when you don't know how many times you're going to go. So while a is um, while a is greater than b, and maybe If we, if we keep incrementing b, eventually this condition will be false. I guess I should have printed out b. That would have been more useful. Okay, so when b became 10, a is greater than B became false and we stepped out. And what we should have really done is walk through that loop in the debugger to see what it's happening. So looking at a loop, even though this one is very simple, looking at it, which which is what we just did to see what it does, is, is not what I would usually do. I would just walk through it in the debugger and have it show me what it's doing. It doesn't take any time. Um, F6, if you can remember, is... And F6 doesn't work because I have a recording program that is using the F keys. Sorry about that. Yeah, let's just walk through it and see what it's doing. And when this is evaluates to false, then that loop is over. You should use a while loop when you don't know how many times the loop is going to happen. Here's a do while loop. Do while loops are frowned upon. We don't think this way. So do this while this is true, as opposed to while this is true, do this. Um, if you're going to use a do while loop ever, you need to have a very good reason for why you're doing it. I'm going to try and make sure that my code is following standards as we go along. Okay, so a do while loop. The rule is the same. It has to be a boolean here. It will stop the first time that that's false. Um, they exist in, it's called a post test loop. It exists in all languages and hopefully you won't, you won't use it. Here's a for loop. It's a little bit more interesting. Oops. SYSO control space. Print out the I. 
the for loop just a little bit interesting because I didn't click on the bug run to the next breakpoint I'll just turn that one off run to the next breakpoint in Java you're expected to declare the control variable inside of the loop so this variable comes into existence here and it goes away after the for loop is over. Expression 1 happens only one time. Expression 2 happens next. We don't go and do expression 3. Let's step I wonder if I change the code and that will cause me problems. No, it was okay with it. So what what is the value of i? It's zero. We have not done expression three. Expression three happens at the bottom of the loop. So i has become, well, in the debugger, i will become one only after we get up to the top again. So using the debugger to step through a for loop is a little bit difficult because you have only one line of code, but it's doing three things at three different times. The key to remember is that the expression 3 happens as if it were on a line by itself down at the bottom. So the first value of i is the initial one assuming that this condition is true. Stepping through a for loop is a little bit trickier and there are people who believe that expression 3 is going to happen first before you go into the body of the loop but it does not. Expression 3 happens as if it were on a line by itself down at the bottom of the loop right here before the close brace. That means that plus plus i would do exactly the same thing. Plus plus i and i plus plus pre and post increment. The first value that we're using is zero. That's identical to the previous example. So plus plus i and i plus plus in this case don't make any difference because this is considered a line of code by itself down at the bottom of the for loop. Ask the machine to show you. Now the for loop allows you to do more things than that. We could say j gets 5 and comma separated j minus minus and then print out i and j so expression 3 comma separated we can do more than one thing and expression 1 we can declare more than one variable so we have an i going up and a j going down hmm an i going up and a j going down. Let's run to the breakpoint and watch this happen. Stepping in is f6. Stepping over, I'm sorry, is f6. So i is 0 and j is 5 on the first time through. And then i is 1 and j is 4. So is this a good idea? It is not. <clears throat> so the functionality of the language, the power of the language, what it allows you to do doesn't necessarily mean that's what you should do. And 80% of the cost of code is figuring out what someone else did. There is no reason to be doing this. 
it's not easy to understand, it's not easy to read, it will slow down the user, the reader of your code. You didn't need to do it, and it only made the code more complicated. You could have declared a different variable j and have j decrement inside of the loop as opposed to mixing even more things on the for loop. There are people who disagree with that. They're wrong in my class. If someone is writing your paycheck, maybe they're right. But for me, they're wrong. Make it as simple as possible. Let's talk about break and continue. So if you execute a break statement inside of a loop, whether it's a while loop, a do while loop, or a, a for loop, the loop is over. Let's run to let's run to that breakpoint and see what happens. So i and j are zero and five. Now we have i plus j is equal to five, and when we execute the break statement. The loop is over. Okay, so we have functionality now to end the loop prematurely. It's called an early exit. An early exit from a loop almost always means that you couldn't figure out what the stop condition should be. And then when you're writing the code, somehow you decide, oh, I need to get out of here, and you put in a break statement. Um, if you use a break statement, you have to have a very good reason for doing it. So for me, no break statements unless they're in a switch. Almost always, if you use a break statement, it's because you didn't figure out what the stop condition should be for the loop. In a for loop, you should never change the control variables. Let's go back to a reasonable for loop that has only one control variable. Well, What's happening here? Inside the loop, you're deciding that you need to change the value of the control variable. This will work. Don't ever do it. If you need to change the control variable inside of a for loop, switch to a while loop. When I look at a for loop, I know how many times the for loop will go by looking at one line of code. That's the advantage of having a for loop in the language at all. If you change the control variable inside the for loop, you've changed someone's interpretation of what that for loop is going to do. And that's really, really, really frowned upon. So if you do find out that you need to change the control variable, switch to a while loop. The continue statement is similar. In a continue, what does that mean? Continue means go to the next iteration of the loop. When i is 5, continue means execute expression 3 and start the next iteration. 
This is also frowned upon. I guess I need to save my code once in a while. So we were going through that loop, outputting two, three, four, and then we skipped five. Continue is a valid control structure inside of a for loop, and it means don't finish the body of the loop at this time, go and start the next iteration. So in a for loop, it means execute expression 3, and then come in again. Um, don't do it. If you, if you imagine that a loop gets larger and larger, the body of the loop has 30 lines in it instead of these three, and you've got lots of breaks and continues, no one will ever figure out what you've done. So, break and continue are frowned upon. They're in there. All languages have them, including C and C++, and um, there's a new kind of one in C-sharp, but they, um, they're good for the person who's writing the code and bad for the person who's trying to read it. 80% of the cost of code is figuring out what someone else did, so we're going to favor the person who's reading the code over the person who's writing it. It's a cost issue. If you're in software development, that's important. If you're in computer science, it might not be important. It still should be, but it might not be. Software development is a business. Computer science is a science. Correctness in a business is when it's cheap or effective. The enhanced for loop is new, um, oh, I don't know, maybe in um, maybe in Java 6, I can't remember, maybe in 4. The enhanced for loop, um, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I'm programming in, in C. Well, we haven't gone over arrays yet, but I think that this is probably not um, too foreign to you. But I wanted to show you the enhanced for loop. Um, along with the other control structures. So this is what it looks like. You declare on the left of a colon a temporary variable and then you name something that is a collection of something. So in this case it's an array of ints and each time through the loop whoops, I keep doing that. Each time through the loop this variable will have the next one in the array. So it's just slightly easier than the traditional for loop where you declare an index variable and you index the elements of the array. Um, if we walk through that in the debugger we should be able to see what's going on. So there's the first element of the array and the second and the third. Think, read this as um, for each element in array. So the colon is read as in 
for each element in array, do something with that element. Element is not a keyword. I made that identifier up. I would have used A, except I had already declared A up here. So for each in, for each int in array. And again, when you have a chance to use the enhanced for loop, it's expected that you will, because it's a little bit easier. The tricky thing that people are confused about with the enhanced for loop is that um, you cannot put anything into the array using the enhanced for loop. Suppose I said Did I fill up the array with 27s? In fact, I didn't. Um, you cannot use this for putting stuff into an array, only for getting stuff out. So you can get an element of the array out and do something with it, but you can't replace the elements of the array. So this line of code did nothing in that case. Okay, so what are the takeaways from this video? These are the control structures for the language, the primitive parts of the language. This is all that there are. These are the selections, and these are the repetitions. Set a breakpoint early, walk through the code often, Java code cannot hide anything from you. You will never ever say, I don't know what it's doing. Set a breakpoint and look at everything that it's doing, one line at a time. Format your code all the time. Don't present unformatted code to someone else. Don't read unformatted code that someone else has presented to you. And in fact, if you present unformatted code to me, I'll just send it back. I, I'm not going to read it. It's like writing English and leaving out all of the spaces between the words and say, well, it's all there, you figure it out. That's not a professional way of working. You have to present code that someone else can read. And you will get comfortable with, as we go along, the spacing that's acceptable. So if you're writing code like this, that's not acceptable and the formatter will not fix it for you. But a space before and after every operator, whoops, and everyone on your team will write code the same way and you'll get used to reading the code the way that um, writing the code that other people expect it to look like. And it's important for speed, it's important for figuring out what someone else did, that's 80% of the cost of the code. Very good, we're, we're on our roll, we're going pretty fast. I'll see you in the next video.